Okay, guys. Um, before I read this uh, this poem, this is a really um, rich and complicated poem, and so I'm going to do my best to uh, to give you all that I can from it. Uh, it's like a sponge to be squeezed, and I'm going to probably not be able to squeeze as much out of it as I'd like to, given the time constraints. However, uh, what I think you should do at this point is um, to go ahead and and pause and go ahead and mark the poem up as you see that uh, that I have marked it. And I'll go ahead and mark a couple things for you to point to them anyway. Um, the outrides occur here with dragonflies uh, tumbled. You're going to see it with the word two here. And then down here at um, uh, the word what. And then I'm pretty sure that's all the outrides that we have for this poem. So go ahead and pause and, uh, and mark. Th these lines are all off of a uh, four beat line. So go ahead and mark them as indicated. And you want to go ahead and and mark the number of syllables per line that I have here. I'm going to I'm going to comment on that uh, at the end, and then go ahead and mark it up as the uh, Petrarchan sonnet that it is, which is basically A B B A, A B B A, and the C D C D C D at the end. Um, I'll argue a little bit later, uh, briefly. I hope I remember to get back to it. That in essence. Justices, graces, he is, places, his, faces, these are all slant rhymes. Uh, so you could, uh, I think, argue for, uh, for making this sestet um, C slant C, C slant C, C slant C. But if you want to mark it as I have marked it, uh, that's fine. So go ahead and um, uh, pause and then uh, mark it up and then join me in a second. Okay, so what's um, what's particularly noteworthy about this poem is that um, this is a uh, maybe as good an example as we have of a um, a poem emblematic of the two ideas that um, that Hopkins tries to express in his poetry. Um, uh, this is the concept of of inscape and in stress. All right, so he he read the uh, the work of a um, of a theologist from I think like early 14th century uh, named Dun Scotus. Okay, and so what he says is that um, that everything in the universe is characterized by uh, what he's calling an inscape or inscape, and it's this this sort of distinctive cosmic design that makes up individual identity. All right. And so he believes in that its identity is not a, a, a static thing, but it's a dynamic thing, that it's ever evolving based on all the, you know, the powers of observation and uh, the individual's um, uh, being in the world and being influenced by the things that, uh, that God has created. Okay? So each being then um, in the universe uh, selves, okay? in, in other words, it's um, it enacts its identity, okay. It's almost like when you think about um, um, the concept of a um, like an iceberg calving. Um, it seems this dynamic process. Uh, so here is what he's what he's thinking about here, and the um, uh, he's using then the encounter. Uh, sort of the uh, the comparison that he makes of the kingfisher catching fire is is all about this sense of the self radiating out into the into the universe uh, the way that God in Christ in humans radiates out into the universe. So you're going to see a, a whole repetition of of these basic. Um, it's an image classification. Well, let's call it resonance, um, if you like, or echoing, if you like. But one of those things, it's the sense of things radiating out from a center. And we'll talk about some of the uh, the images that are associated with that. Okay, so so the the idea is that um, uh, because human beings are the most highly selved, maybe you could argue that they're the only uh, beings in creation that can self, they have a sense of self. Um, 
that each self recognizes the uh, this inscape of other beings in um, I guess you say it's, a, it's an act that Hopkins calls in stress okay so it's the um, it's the understanding of the recognition of um, an object in its in its own individual um, sort of radiation of energy uh, toward it that allows it to uh, to realize its specific distinctiveness okay so and I'm going to read here from um, uh, from what your editor says ultimately the in stress of inscape leads one to Christ for the individual identity of any object is the stamp of divine creation on it in the act of in stress therefore the human being becomes a celebrant of the divine at once recognizing God's creation and enacting his or her own God-given identity within it and so poetry then for Hopkins is this manifestation of is the manifestation of this idea. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, and read. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and read the poem, as kingfishers catch fire. As kingfishers catch fire, dragonflies draw flame. As tumbled over a rim in roundy wells, stones ring like each. Tucked string tells each hung bell's bow swung finds tongue to fling out broad its name. Each mortal thing does one thing and the same, deals out that being, endures each one dwells, selves goes itself, myself it speaks and spells crying, what I do is me, for that I came. I say more, the just man justices, keeps grace, that keeps all his goings graces, acts in God's eye, what in God's eye he is, Christ. For Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes not his, to the Father, through the features of men's faces." Okay, so among the things that, that we want to um, uh, take a look at here, um, we've discussed often the idea that form follows function. And the way that form follows function here is that um, uh, if you understand basically the um, the concept of the Trinity, uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being one God, then what Hopkins does in his discussion of this concept of there being um, multiple beings, multiple uh, concepts rolled into one, he uses an array of different, not only um, you know it's sort of poetic and rhetorical devices to make this idea manifest in the poem. So let's take a look at, um, um, at a number of, of things here in the beginning. Okay, so uh, you, you can't escape all the, uh, all the, the figures of repetition are front and center here, and you're gonna learn some new ones today because this idea of, uh, I talked about resonance, um, and, and things that are resounding and, and echoing out, radiating from a center. The, the idea then of, uh, of repetition, okay, of something carrying on, of course he would use these sorts of devices to, uh, to help accentuate the, the fundamental theme of the poem. So if you take a look then, um, let's just start with the, with the opening word. Okay, so he says, as, King fishers catch fire, dragonflies draw flame. So what he means by that is that the, the word as, uh, as used in this context, is not only at the same time, okay, at the same time, but in the same way, okay? Dragonflies draw flame as kingfishers catch fire. This is the uh, the image that to, to have in mind here at the beginning is this, that um, 
um, the, the way that, that um, beings made from God act in the universe is that they leave something like a trail. Um, and so, again, this idea of uh, if you've ever seen uh, like a vapor trail behind a, uh, a jet or, uh, or anything, like, like um, a wake behind a boat, all these sorts of things are, uh, are in play here. As we um, as we look at the at the poem, so another word, and, and like I said, I'm not I'm not going to um, uh, spend too much time on these things because there are just so many of them. But here, as as kingfishers catch fire, so the idea of of being ignited by, right, and also to absorb, all right, in the same way, then. If we look at at the word draw, it's uh, not only then to 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 make a mark, as in you know to draw something. So I'll just use the word etch um, as not a bad way to, but also then to attract. So you can see that as these two things are being compared, the the kingfishers and the dragonflies. And if you've never seen a kingfisher, look look it up. It's a, a super colorful bird, and um, uh, it, it's it, it's got a lot of you know bright intense colors in the same way that. Um, uh, that dragonflies uh, do, especially when the when the light uh, catches off uh, off the wings of the bird, then and the wings of the dragonfly. All right. Um, let's see. So you can't escape the the uh, all the alliteration, the repetition of the various uh, the the hard K sound of kingfishers catch. Um, right in 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 those opening words, and then we've got the F in fishers, the F in fire. The FL and flies and FL and flame, and then we've got dragon flies and draw. Okay, so just look at all that, you know. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if I ask you a question about that. And remember, when I ask you questions about alliteration, I'm looking for the sounds that uh, repeat themselves. And so, as alliteration, that um, that rhetorical figure then, which is just drawing emphasis to itself. So again, uh, as we often see in in Hopkins poems. The, the acoustics of the words as they are supposed to be spoken aloud so you can hear them they they are are layering over uh, a music over the the visual imagery and um, and all those sorts of things so this is an intensely visual thing but it's also got that um, uh, the overlay of uh, of music of the spoken sounds each syllable in in combination chiming and ringing off each other okay so this poem starts like the wind hover did, which is um, uh, Hopkins speaker or Hopkins himself observation of a bird. Okay, so notice again, as tumbled over rims in roundy wells. So we got the uh, the repetition of the R's there. Uh, but notice if so so think of if you drop a stone into a water, right? What does it do? It radiates out from the waves radiate out from the center, in the same way that sound waves radiate out from from their source so I hope you see this uh, this happening here stones in roundy sto uh, roundy well stones ring so if you ever dropped a stone into a well I, I doubt that many of you have but if you did you would hear that both the, the water splashes and there's that ringing out of the water um, and then there's also the ringing out of the sound and so then he plays that in with the plucked string um, like with a, um, a harp or some kind of instrument of that nature. And then each hung bell's bow swung fine's tongue. It's that marvelous image because that, what, what is the, the clapper of a bell? Um, uh, it, it looks like a tongue in a mouth. And so as the bell speaks its sound, um, just like the, the human mouth through the tongue uh, speaks out. And so this is, of course, um, synecdoche here. With the thing about the tongue, okay, good example of synecdoche there. Um, notice all that the, we have the internal rhyme of tells and bells, uh, which is playing off of wells from before. So even in the again the repetition of the word sounds like this um, this echoing of things. Yep. Okay. Um, want to let's see introduce you to a new um, rhetorical concept here as if you need another one to have and um, so it, it it's here at line five each mortal thing does one thing 
and the same. So you might be asking yourself, well, like, why, why is he repeating himself in this way? Well, this is a, um, a figurative device called Antana Classis. A-N-T-A-N-A-C-L-A-S-I-S. -A -A okay, so Antana Classis is a word that obtains two or more meanings when repeated. Okay? Word that obtains two or more meanings when repeated. And um, you're going to see just a boatload of, uh, of this device. This device shows up in a bunch of different places. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and, um, um, and I'm going to mark them all. Okay? So, uh, and I'll do that with, um, with a box. Keeps grace that keeps all his goings graces. I'll come back to the Palyptaton in a second. Um, God's eye. What in God's eye he is. So th this is uh, metaphorically speaking uh, the, the way God sees things as opposed to the physical, uh, the physical eye. Uh, then we have here repetition of Christ. So, uh, and, and I'll go back and, and describe that in a second. And then again, we have lovely and lovely. So these are all examples of antanaclasis. All right. Okay. Uh, let's. I, I, we should probably go ahead and. Um, and look at the um, yeah we'll, we'll walk through some some of the words that have dual meanings. Okay, so we talked about the business of the of the bell. Um, each mortal thing does one thing. Okay, so mortal thing as in uh, the sense of it being a creature, and saying does one thing. So this is uh, one action. So now again, thing changes meanings in that in the repetition of it, and then the business of deals out that being. So here, the word being means a creature as well, and think of it as um, as positioned. All right. Um, now. Here's the concept. So this is the business um, of it fulfilling the individuality. So this is what the whole um, in stress and inscape combination has to do with. All right. So notice the great, I mean, just an absolutely beautiful example of polyptaton. Selves, itself, myself. Selves goes itself, myself it speaks and spells. Crying, what I do is me, for that I came. And this should be the, uh, uh, you should hear the echo of Christ's uh, preachings in this, right? Uh, where, where Christ is, is clear on what it was that God sent him to, on earth to do. And, and then, you know, once we come to full realization of that, and if we believe that, um, that we are in Christ and Christ is in us, that's an example of uh, chiasmus right there, then we can all see that we have something that we are, are supposed to be doing in the world. And so in the, in the sestet, he doubles down on the concepts that he has raised in the, uh, in the opening octave. He says, I say more, and more here means two things. One, the speaker is saying, I believe that what man came for is more than that. In addition to the idea of him saying more, as in uh, additionally. Right? Then, the just man, justices, so that's a good example of polyptaton, right? Which we know is the repetition of words that have the same root. 
So justices here means acts in a just manner. But he makes it like a verb, okay? So it, he justices, so in, in his very being, he radiates out justice, justness. Yep. Okay. Keeps grace. The just man justices keeps grace. That keeps, okay? So as in retains. So notice the echo to the, this business up here about drawing and catching and keeping. That keeps. Here, keeps uh, with our example of uh, uh, Antanaclasis continues all his goings graces yep and here once again look at that polyptaton I don't want to I don't want to go so far as to say that this poem is dense with rhetorical figures of repetition but I mean you can see just how many examples of the of the things that we're talking about have made an appearance and they all worked in in concert to make this argument. We talked about the fact that a Petrarchan sonnet is an argument. And so the, the concept that he raises here in the octave, he then, like I said, doubles down on it here in the sestet. Okay? Acts in God's eye what in God's eye he is. Christ. For Christ plays in 10,000 places. Again, the idea that if... if all these people around and, and okay so when we're talking about a divine being can you make the claim that it's hyperbolic I mean uh, it, it seems like this is a uh, you know small number uh, relative to and it's not even so much a, a question of of believers doing this the, the, the concept here is that God and Christ and the Holy Spirit they exist in everyone irrespective of those people's belief systems or or whatever Okay, it's just a marvelous concept uh, that we have here to, uh, to consider that he uh, uh, tries to bring out for us in the poem. All right. Okay, so Christ plays in ten thousand places, lovely in limbs, and lovely in eyes, not him, not his. So lovely is in the aesthetic quality, but also lovely as in the act of loving. And lovely in eyes, not his, to the Father, through the features of men's faces. Right. So if if everyone is made in in the image of God, then we see the the God that is within us reflected back to us from other people. Isn't that great? This is why when you you know we. I used to do this drawing exercise with my um, students in, in AP about the concept of seeing. And if you ask people to draw, um, uh, just draw a face, okay, just, you know, a, a cartoon of, of a face. Most people do it this way, right? So if we draw the head, and they put the eyeballs way up here, right? But that's not where they live. Eyeballs aren't, aren't up top, up at your forehead. They're midway down. Eyes are here. And the ears are there, okay? But it's because we we look each other um, in the face that we forget about the airspace that's above the eyes. Uh, look at the self-representation here with the ball man. Should I put that scar that I got uh, up on my melon uh, up here, the turkey foot scar? I guess I probably should. Okay. All right, that's what I have for this poem. It's just absolutely fantastic. And um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did.